Okay, welcome back. Uh, this section, uh, which is actually the fourth video called Section 3, uh, talks about Americans on the European front and is going to look at uh, some of the things that, that go on during the American part of the war. Now understand something, we're not going to go really deep into battles, battle plans, weapons, and things like that. We have a different class for that called American Military History. If you're into those things, you take that as a sophomore, junior, or senior. Uh, so don't be looking for specific strategies on how many bullets came out of a gun in a minute. Now, preparing for war. Now, the big thing I need you guys to understand is in 1917, when we declared war, we were not the well-oiled machine that we kind of view the American military to be today. And instead, we had about the large, the 16th largest military in the world, with only about 100,000 troops. Now, if you remember back to the Battle of the Marne, the Battle of the Marne lasted nine days and about 500,000 people died. So we have roughly, you know, what is it? Uh, a day's worth of guys if things went really, really bad. One of the first things you have to do is name a leader. Uh, that leader was probably the, the most decorated and longest serving general in the United States military, John Pershing. <clears throat> you may remember Pershing. He's come up a couple of times before. Um, he was in charge of the Buffalo Soldiers in the Spanish-American War and went up uh, the San Juan Heights with the uh, Rough Riders. So right away on the day that war was declared, we sent our Navy. The reason for that is we got to try to keep the ocean safe so we can send things across. We sent supplies, $3 billion, which doesn't sound like much, but back then it was a ton. And about well, roughly 15,000 troops. <coughs> Again, not very many guys because that's less than fit in the Cole Center for a Badger basketball game. Pershing suggested we were going to need somewhere in the vicinity of a million men. We had 100,000. <coughs> and so Congress passed the Selective Service Act, um, which authorized a draft. Um, now, unlike a lot of other times in history where there's a draft, this one actually had a pretty positive feeling to it. About 3 million men were drafted. Most of them never served for various reasons. Um, from the war ended before they were needed to, you know, different medical issues and things like that. There used to be a lot more medical restrictions that got you kind of eliminated from being draftable. Just so you guys know, guys, especially, uh, you have to sign up for selective services when you turn 18. You can't be drafted right now because there is no draft, but it, it, it you still have to be sign up in case they ever reinstitute it. Can't get college loans and things like that if you don't. Now, getting our army over there. Um, so in September of 1917, the draftees reported for training uh, for a defensive war. The training wasn't good. I mean, how do you train someone to fight like a prairie dog? Hide in a hole, pop out when you need to, run across here. There was bayonet training. There was shooting training, you know, basic calisthenics and physical fitness. But probably the biggest worry was how do we get our troops across the ocean with all those U-boats out there? The U-boats had sunk about 400 ships in 1917 alone. And so we started using something called a convoy system. Now, a convoy is where you take your troop ships or you take any ship and you surround them with your most aggressive boats. So take a troop ship with 10,000 men on board, surround them with our ships with the really big guns. If a U-boat fires on one of those boats, the other boats are going to open fire and the U-boat is going to be sunk, probably not worth the loss of life. And so that convoy system safely gets American ships from point A, uh, the United States to point B, France. Um, but when they first got there, Americans were instantly sent into war. Um, Pershing met with the French leader, Foch, and Foch said he wanted to use the Americans as fill-ins. When a Frenchman or a British man was killed, they'd plug an American in in that spot. Pershing said he wasn't going to do that, and he kept his troops separate and said, well, we'll fight when you guys finally think you need us as one large American army. The one exception to that, Pershing did allow African-American soldiers to be used as substitutes. Uh, a little racist. Sorry about that, guys. Um, now, Americans did surprise the Europeans with their strength and fighting ability. <coughs> Europeans kind of um, viewed Americans as being like these lazy people and, you know, incapable of like, you know, good fighting at this point. We did get the nickname Yanks or Yankees. Um, we were often called Doughboys. Don't think that we were fat and that's why they called us Doughboys. We were a little heavier than the rest of them because they've been fighting for all this time. Okay. Um, we did fight in segregated units, though. Uh, white soldiers were sent to one area, black soldiers, Latino soldiers in one area. One of the most highly decorated groups was an African-American group from Harlem called the Harlem Hellfighters. Um, way too many medals, way too many Purple Hearts. You get a Purple Heart when you're injured or killed in battle. Um, since the Germans didn't have to fight against the Russians anymore, they shifted all of their soldiers to the Russian or to the Western Front, 
And when we decide to get actively involved, the Germans are within 50 miles of Paris. Defeating Paris is essentially defeating France. The Americans then joined the, the battles, and we fought in three major battles, you know, right away, the uh, Battle of Cantigny, Belle Wood, and a place called Chateau Thierry. Uh, all of these are, are major victories for the Allies, and we kind of entrench ourselves as being a major player and a major factor in the war. The Germans decide to launch one last offensive at a second Battle of the Marne, um, where they make a major push into the Allied lines, but then the Americans come in with the help of both our ground troops and Billy Mitchell's Air Force and are able to force the Germans back. From this point, uh, the Germans are forced back towards Germany. Um, about 250,000 Americans have arrived, and so we launch a major aggressive offensive toward them. We break through the Hindenburg Line, which is, is kind of like the Germans. They had trenches that were like fortified, concrete, steel, things like that. But we're able to break through those lines and basically have the Germans on the run. Um, the German general, Erich von Ludendorff, advised the Kaiser, Wilhelm II, that it was time to settle for peace. Um, the German troops were starting to lose interest in the fighting. Uh, things were not going well. It was obvious that they were going to be defeated. Um, after the Meuse Argonne offensive, uh, another offensive launched by the Allies, the Germans were in full retreat. And what we really see in, the, in, this, in these things is technology changes war forever. The airplane, the tank, all these different things are, become a big deal. Eddie Rickenbacker becomes the big flying hero of this war. And that, that, that love of airplanes will carry through into the next decades when uh, a lot of American pop culture and things become dominated by this interest in airplanes and flying. Um, you know, things like Amelia Earhart, Charles Lindbergh, passenger flight, things like that. The end of the war, the final war, months of the war were a little different. Um, people knew the end was near. Um, some areas were particularly bloody, but some areas were very calm. Um, unfortunately, at the same time that the war is ending, uh, a major influenza epidemic breaks out and kills millions of people globally. Um, toward the end of the war, the German troops began to rebel, and the Kaiser fled to neutral Holland on November 10th, 1918. Uh, he fled to a neutral country because then he couldn't be punished for any of the things that he did. Um, finally, on 11-11, at 11-11 a.m., the fighting stops. Now, they called November 11th Armistice Day, and they celebrated it that way until the end of World War II. And now November 11th is known to us as Veterans Day, where we celebrate all veterans, uh, those who fought and those who died. Uh, but they conveniently just kind of used the date that they had from Armistice Day when World War I ended. Um, when all the fighting was done, 125,000 Americans died. About 8 million people had died total. Um, those numbers are obviously very high. Now, basically an entire generation of people were wiped out in, in Europe, Germany. Men between 18 to 35 were, were hard to come by. But the other thing that started to bother the rest of the world is there's evidence of something called genocide in parts of Europe. Uh, genocide is where you try to wipe out a racial or ethnic group. And we we're starting to see some evidence that the Germans had started some some campaigns to get rid of certain groups of people that unfortunately we continue into world war two. All right. Now that's really all we're going to give you about the fighting. Obviously, you know, you got to see some of what it would look like in all quiet on the Western front. And again, if you're interested in the specifics of battles or guns or, or what the planes look like and things like that, it's probably a great idea uh, to take that military history class in the future. Again, remember to spar if needed, stop, pause and rewind. And we've got one more video yet, which is going to be on the American home front and the peace treaty. Again, make sure you guys get these notes down. We will be taking a test on this unit to go along with the mini projects. Let me know if you have any questions.